for part eight, we're going to get into the next logical step of talking about psychotherapy. And let's talk about evaluating psychotherapies. How do we decide which ones are good, bad, useful, unuseful? How much does it depend on the situation, on the individual? It's a complicated process. So let's talk about it. So the big question that a lot of people will ask is, does psychotherapy work? And most psychologists would agree that that's kind of an oversimplification of the question. And if you wanted to ask a better question, you have to kind of quantify that. So instead of asking just, does psychotherapy in general work? Let's break it down. Let's uh, have some specificity to this question. So we can talk about, well, which kinds of therapy are you asking about? Which kinds of therapists? Which kinds of clients? Which kinds of problems? And which kinds of effects are you looking at? So the answer to that question of does it work could depend on what you're looking at. So if it works, might depend on the type of therapy and which therapist is giving that therapy, and which client is receiving that therapy, and which problem they're trying to treat with that therapy, and what kind of effect or outcome they're going to get from it. So this is a much more complex and uh, complicated question than what we might think of on the surface. But despite that complexity, the question is still really important to answer. Because trying to choose and administer the most appropriate kind of therapy to the right client at the right time in the right situation is going to be the best way to treat different kinds of psychological disorders or behavioral problems or whatever. So actually finding an answer to this question is fairly important, especially for us as psychologists. So how do we actually try and evaluate what makes a good therapy? How do we evaluate the effectiveness of different therapies? How do we evaluate the effectiveness of different therapists? And so on and so forth. And the answer is, again, complicated. Most of the time, the sort of burden of proof, and I don't like using it that way, but we're not technically going to prove anything. We're just going to give some evidence in support of, as we learned earlier in the course. Um, but this, this burden of showing effectiveness is going to fall to the people who are trying to employ this kind of therapy. So we might have uh, third party companies who are trying to show that this is the best course of action. So maybe insurance companies or um, hospitals or whatever. They're going to try and set up studies that'll show which types of therapies are most effective in which situations. Now, you can probably see that there are going to be difficulties. A lot of problems that come down to different psychotherapies is it's very difficult to control variables. Especially when we've walked through all the different kinds of therapies so far in this chapter, there aren't many that follow very structured, rigorous guidelines. We think about, oof, right at the very beginning, we go back to psychoanalysis, where we have free association. Well, that's not structured or controlled at all. The client just talks about whatever pops into their mind. So there's a lot of uncontrolled variables there. We have lots of differences with these client-therapist interactions. So maybe a client and therapist get along really well. Maybe a different client with the same therapist don't get along as well. So there's lots of different interactions and again, variables within it that aren't necessarily well controlled because it's pretty much impossible to control them. It's also very, very hard to control or to measure therapeutic effects. How do you determine if a therapy was effective? How do you quantify how much better someone's social skills are? Or how do you quantify how much better your relationship with your mother is? These are very difficult to measure and to quantify, and you kind of have to quantify them to compare them to other people in other situations. And you have a problem of who's measuring these outcomes? 
Is the client going to self-report on how much better they're feeling? Is the therapist going to report on how well the client did? Is some third party going to evaluate both of them? All of this is going to affect what we get as an outcome. It's all going to affect the data that we receive, and therefore it's going to affect the conclusions that we draw from that data. So if we come over here to different sources of data, you can have a therapist's ratings. So how are they evaluating their client? Client self-report, like we talked about, where the client decides or reports on how well they feel, uh, how much improvement do they think they've gone through. Um, you can have ratings of the client by close acquaintances. So find people who know the client and ask them about how much the client has improved. Um, client could self-monitor their own behavior. So if they were trying to fix a particular maladaptive behavior, maybe they report how often it happens. Or behavioral observations. Maybe we use voice recorders or video cameras to track their behavior over time. And so this data is all trying to get at our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, um, but they're going about it in a bunch of different ways. Because as we talked about at the very beginning of the course, when psychology is dealing with trying to quantify and measure and study behavior, some of the things we're trying to study are fairly abstract. It's hard to quantify thoughts. It's hard to quantify emotions. Um, some observable behaviors are a little bit easier to measure and report, but it's still not as concrete as we might like as a researcher. So what kind of research methods can we use to try and evaluate the effectiveness of these different types of treatments? Well, when we started, or if we think back to, say, Freud and other psychoanalysts back in the 30s and 40s, they would have focused on case studies. So they would look at single individuals who went through their therapy and they would try and quantify how much they improved. They didn't necessarily do large scale testings. They didn't compare hundreds of people. They would look at small cases, case studies, with very small numbers of individuals who had been treated. The biggest problem with this kind of approach is that they would only have evaluated people who underwent therapy. If you think back to chapter two when we talked about good science, you really want to have an experimental group and a control group. You want to have a group that went through therapy and a group who didn't go through therapy. And you want to compare the level of improvement of those who weren't treated in therapy and those who were treated in therapy to make sure that therapy was the thing that differed between the groups and therefore was probably causing the improvement. But with case studies, they would only look at how these individuals changed over time. And if they're being evaluated by their therapists, well, maybe they would just keep them in therapy until they improved. So it's not necessarily a good measure or a good method for evaluating effectiveness. Now, this problem was first highlighted in the 1950s when ISENC had decided to look into something called spontaneous remission, where basically they figured out that patients who were never treated by therapists, individuals who had previously been insured with disability, they ended up having spontaneous remission where they would spontaneously no longer be off on disability because their condition had improved. So spontaneous remission, meaning that with no treatment at all, their situation had improved. And this symptom reduction, even without treatment, was occurring at a rate as high as the success rate that had been reported by our early therapists. So because our early therapists didn't have that control group to show that spontaneous remission was a thing, they had concluded that therapy was helping, when in fact, if we had introduced a control group, we'd find that it was no different. So the therapy was as effective as having done nothing, which is not super good at telling us that the therapy was effective. And so this conclusion has sort of led through the years of different standards that help ensure that re uh, reports of success 
are actually backed by sound science. So when we ask the question, does therapy work? We know that there are APA guidelines, or the American Psychological Association, who have taken it upon themselves to make sure that any studies that claim that a therapy is effective have been conducted as good science, where they haven't forgotten to include a control group or something silly like that. So we have more confidence now that when someone reports that a therapy is effective, that that conclusion has been drawn from actual solid scientific research. And by having that knowledge and having that good science, we can now start evaluating which therapies are going to be effective in treating which disorders. So what makes a good research setup to evaluate the effectiveness of a psychotherapy. Now, this is going to be quite a bit of refresher from chapter two, so we won't spend too, too much time on the details here, because we've already done this. But to be a good study, a good design, we want something that has randomized clinical trials. So we want that random assignment of clients to be in either the experimental or the control group. We want to have people who receive the treatment, and we want to have people who are a control in some way. And we have three different types of control groups that are commonly seen in these sorts of experiments. So one would be a no treatment group. So a group that doesn't get treatment, they don't do anything, they're just there. So that would be like um, ISANC comparing um, individuals who had been through therapy versus spontaneous remission of people who had no treatment at all. Um, another type of control group would be our placebo control condition. And in this case, instead of being given nothing, the placebo group would be given some sort of treatment that shouldn't have any effect on their behavior, but doesn't allow the individual to know that they're not receiving treatment. So in drug trials, you would have a sugar pill as a placebo. So an individual in the study doesn't know if they've received a pill that is the actual drug being tested, or if they've received a sugar pill. And by controlling for the client's expectations, for them thinking that they're being treated, then you can remove or control for extra variables. So a placebo control condition can be effective though it isn't always possible um, if your treatment is something like talking to a therapist, it's kind of hard to have them fake talk to a therapist. So maybe there are ways to make that work. Um, or we can also have control groups where they compare to some other effective treatment. In a lot of cases, they'll compare uh, the treatment of interest being a new treatment, something that they're trying to show the effectiveness of, and they would compare it to the existing accepted treatment. That might be some other kind of effective treatment that you can compare it to. And a lot of times you'll see this set up specifically when it isn't ethical not to treat someone. So it isn't ethical to not give someone treatment for a disease that is treatable. So in that case, your quote-unquote control group is still going to be receiving a treatment, but it's a treatment that's already been established in its effectiveness, and then we're comparing a new treatment to the existing treatment, if that makes sense. Now, like I mentioned, the APA has gotten involved in all of these kinds of tests. So the APA guidelines for our randomized clinical trials state that you have to have standardized procedures. So the treatment has to follow a very predictable pattern, and the procedure has to be followed exactly. So you would probably have a script that you need to read for each individual that you interact with. If you're giving a pill, it has to be given at the same time of day, by the same person, in the same manner. Um, so you have to control and standardize as much of the scenario as possible. Um, they also require that the sessions are either taped or observed by someone external to the experiment. Um, and those individuals who do any kind of evaluation, anyone who is 
um, scoring something, say, they can't know which condition the clients are in. You can't know if they're in the experimental group or the control group. Um, and it says here that that's going to minimize our experimenter bias. So this would be something like a double blind, um, where hopefully you would have set it up so that the client doesn't know if they have the uh, placebo or the actual treatment. You also want to make sure that the researcher, the person doing the measuring or observing, also doesn't know if they're in the experimental or control groups. And they also specify that there should be some measure of improvement that has to be behavioral. So there has to be some kind of external measure of improvement. This ties into the next point, which is that there needs to be some kind of follow-up data. So we want to evaluate the effectiveness of this treatment over time. It doesn't matter if it was effective while the treatment was being administered. We really care about how long that change happens or how long it sticks around. So how effective is this over the long term? So there has to be some kind of follow-up data to see what happens in the future. And again, another refresher of a term we've already talked about back in chapter two, we can talk about meta-analysis. And so in a lot of cases, especially when looking at clinical trials like this, researchers will combine the statistical results of many, many studies to try and achieve some kind of overall conclusion. This is really helpful from a bunch of different perspectives, but the biggest one is by looking at multiple studies that have been conducted in a very standardized way, you can increase the effective number of participants because each study had a certain number of participants, and if you look at them all together, you get lots and lots of participants. So by combining like this, you end up increasing something like the effect size. Because we're getting a larger n, um, a larger number of participants, we can be a little bit more confident in the effect that we're observing. So our effect size gets larger. And because our effect size is telling us what percentage of clients receiving a therapy had a more favorable outcome than the average control client, having a larger effect size is telling us that this therapy is more effective, that we're more confident that it is a beneficial therapy. So a large effect size is a good thing. Now the graph on the screen here is talking or is summarizing the data from one particular meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis combined almost 400 different studies of psychotherapy um, broken down by different types of psychotherapy to try and compare the effectiveness of these different types of therapy. And interestingly, we can see that all of our therapies seem to fall in about the same range, somewhere between, say, 57, 58% and 82% improvement. So about uh, 60 to 80% of individuals who received treatment ended up improving more than the average control patient. And this is across all sorts of different kinds of therapies. We have psychodynamic, client-centered, gestalt, systematic desensitization, and operant behavior modification. And this is an interesting finding, and this isn't the only paper that's found this, um, but they term it the dodo bird verdict. And it's actually referring to the dodo bird in Alice in Wonderland, who had said that um, everybody has won and therefore must receive prizes. Um, basically to say that every therapy seems to have quote unquote one here where all sorts of therapies are showing improvement. And that kind of makes sense because these therapies are the ones that have been used quite frequently. They're employed often and they're probably still in use because they're effective. So I don't know how useful this graph is to us, but it does tell us that no one type of therapy seems to stand out over the other. The caveat to that, though, is actually one of the major criticisms to this kind of meta-analysis. And that's the idea that condensing sort of multiple studies, multiple papers, multiple research uh, into this single meta-analysis ends up losing us some really important information. 
So specifically, it might be masking the differential effectiveness or the fact that uh, specific therapies might be more uh, effective at treating some specific clinical disorders, but not others. So by looking at the big picture like this, it tells us that they're all fairly effective overall, but it doesn't give us that fine-grained idea of which specific therapy is most effective for which specific disorder. So there are, of course, many, many studies that we can look at if we wanted to evaluate um, specific therapy that works best with particular disorder, but um, they're going to be much smaller studies that have much smaller ends or numbers of participants than the giant meta-analyses, just in the nature of them. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is actually a really important one to discuss, and this is the idea of clinical significance. And so clinical significance requires that at the end of, a, of therapy, the client seeking treatment for that disorder of interest um, at the end falls within the range of those who are not experiencing the particular problem, which is a fancy way of saying that if someone goes to therapy for depression, that at the end of their treatment, they should score as uh, non-depressed as those who don't go to therapy seeking treatment for depression. So we're saying that the treatment should really only be considered successful if we can reduce or mitigate the thing that brought them to therapy in the first place. And this is really, really important as someone who is a little bit of a statistics nerd, where, yes, you may find that your experimental group is significantly more improved than your control group, but if that improvement isn't actually an improvement in the individual's life, if it doesn't matter in the real world, then it's statistically different, but it isn't um, sort of practically different. There isn't a clinical significance to it. That difference doesn't really mean anything in the real world. And so that's what this idea is getting at, where if we're looking for clinical significance, then we want there to be some kind of tangible, useful change in that individual's life, and not just a statistical change that isn't necessarily going to influence them in their real life. All right, now let's switch directions just a little bit here. Now, we've talked about how do we evaluate the effectiveness of different therapies, and it's sort of as clear as mud, but let's move on and talk about which factors actually affect the outcome of therapy. And so the textbook breaks it down into three broad categories. We have therapist variables, client variables, and techniques. And we're gonna talk about each of these separately. So let's start with our client variables. As a client, they should have openness, which is going to be a willingness to invest in the to invest themselves in therapy. They have to want to be there. They have to be committed to being in therapy. They have to be open to it. And they have to be willing to take risks. So they have to put themselves out there. They have to be willing to make that change to try and make therapy work. Um, the client should also have a degree of self-relatedness. And here, um, it's supposed to be self-relatedness, which is the ability to uh, experience and understand their own internal states. So someone who is seeking therapy should have the ability to sort of evaluate their own internal processes. So uh, understand what's going on internally. Um, for a client to effectively have a good outcome from therapy, they should also be attuned to uh, process, sorry, processes um, that are going on in their relationship with the therapist. So they have to sort of follow along with what the therapist is doing, what they're trying to accomplish, and eventually they want to be able to apply what they learned in therapy to their lives. So a client that has this degree of self-relatedness um, can sort of evaluate their own internal state, 
uh, follow along with the therapist and pay attention and follow through the steps of whatever thing they're trying to do, and then take what they've learned and apply it in their real lives. Um, so that having all of that makes it more likely that this client has a positive outcome from therapy. And the last thing is kind of a logical one, where uh, the nature of the problem that the client is experiencing should fit with the therapy that's being used. So if the client has a problem with anxiety, then they should probably be receiving a treatment that deals with anxiety, as opposed to something else. Um, so if all of these things work together, if the client has all of these, they're a lot more likely to benefit from their therapy. Now, if we look at therapist variables, um, this is going to go back to some of the things we were talking about with Rogers and trying to create um, the best environment with the client based on how the therapist interacted with them. So some similarities here. Um, but for a therapist to have a good relationship with their client and therefore to have their client do better and get better outcomes from therapy, the therapist should be empathetic. They should provide unconditional acceptance and genuineness. So that's the stuff from Rogers. Um, and this stuff should help generate trust with the therapist. So the client should trust the therapist um, in this environment that they've created. And there should be some kind of caring where the therapist shows they genuinely care about the client and that they improve. So these factors, these qualities will help improve the outcome of that therapy. And for our last point, we can talk about techniques. So of course, you want to select and implement the appropriate technique for the specific client that you're dealing with and for the specific situation that they're in. So again, like um, treating someone who has an anxiety disorder with a treatment designed for anxiety, good call. But it's a little bit more than that. Um, some people may be more receptive to different kinds of treatments than others. So if somebody wants to have treatment for anxiety, but if they are heart set against desensitization techniques, then you're going to have to find something else. And so finding a technique that works with both the situation that you're trying to treat and the client and their preferences, you're going to have a much better outcome. One way that people talk about measuring the effectiveness of techniques is to look at the dose response effect. Um, and this is basically looking at the amount of treatment that people receive and the quality of the outcome that comes from that treatment. So we might look at a measure of something like um, people receiving this type of treatment um, over this many sessions, uh, this percentage showed a clinically significant improvement. Um, and that kind of measure would tell us the effectiveness of that technique in that particular situation. And this kind of measure allows us to compare between different studies or different situations. So if you wanted to compare people that received treatment um, that was only done in the lab versus people who received treatment in their home or the natural environment of the client, um, if you found differences in either the amount of treatment meaning the number of sessions that they sat through, um, or in the quality of the outcome, if you see that uh, more or fewer individuals are seeing that clinically significant improvement, you can kind of determine the effectiveness of that particular technique. So for example, if our amount of treatment drops off dramatically, so instead of having 20 sessions, people only have five sessions, but our quality of outcome also drops that might actually be an indicator that people aren't staying with their therapy, they aren't sticking with this particular technique for long enough for it to be effective. That would tell us that we need to find a way to get people to stick around for more treatment to get a better quality outcome. Um, but there's lots of ways you can interpret comparisons of this dose-response effect between different studies. And so if we want to end on a big summation of different factors that seem to be effective in therapy, regardless of types of therapy, we have this list that most studies seem to agree apply to multiple types of therapy. Um, so if 
the client has faith in their therapist, if they believe that they're actually receiving help from that therapist, they are a lot more likely to benefit from the therapy. They're a lot more likely to have that positive outcome. If the client believes that they're being provided a plausible explanation for their problems, if they can look at themselves and the problems in the light of however the therapy is explaining it to them or however their therapist is explaining it to them, um, if they find it plausible, if they believe that this might be a reasonable explanation, again, it's a lot more likely to help them. Clients are a lot more likely to have positive outcomes if the setting is protective, if they feel safe and comfortable and supported in that relationship with their therapist, then they're going to benefit from that therapy a lot more. Um, individuals receiving therapy do a lot better if they have the opportunity to practice the new behaviors that they've learned in therapy. So if they have a chance to actually try out the different techniques that they've been taught in therapy, if they use it more, they're going to benefit more. And of course, individuals that are more optimistic or have a higher level of self-efficacy, if they believe that they have a chance to make this work, if they have a more positive outlook on the therapy, it is, of course, more likely to work.